Karuruda, Senior Resident, Department of Psychiatry, Nimhans. On behalf of the Geriatric Psychiatry Unit, Department of Psychiatry, Nimhans, I am pleased to invite you all to the online CME. The talk will consist of two parts. The first is by Professor P.T. Shiv Kumar, and he will be talking about promoting geriatric mental health care, training, and research through multidisciplinary collaborations. And we are also honored to have with us Dr. Irasima Le Leroy, Leroy from Ireland, who will deliver the guest lecture about the Global SenseCorp project. Now I would like to invite Dr. Vijay to give the welcome speech. Okay. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, it gives me immense pleasure to welcome you all uh, for this uh, evening CME as well as the guest lecture. Uh, as already Isha mentioned, we have uh, two um, uh, two talks. One is the first one is a uh, talk by Professor Preeti Shukumar, and then we have uh, a guest lecture by Dr. Irasi Malaroy. Um, so, it, uh, for this meeting, I would like to welcome you uh, all the participants online first. And because of you, we're able to host this. So thank you uh, for joining us online. Uh, we welcome you all. Uh, I uh, will try and ensure that you have a fruitful evening. Uh, also welcome uh, delegates who are present uh, here in the boardroom. Um, there are quite a, a long list of people uh, who are in, uh, uh, in our uh, team. So in one go, I'll say uh, everyone who belong to, who think they belong to uh, geriatric psychiatry team, I welcome you all. Um, so, Professor Piti Shukumar, Professor uh, Preeti Sinha, who will be joining any minute, uh, then uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Krishna Prasad, Dr. Uh, Ajit Dahale, um, everyone, uh, all the SRs, JRs, uh, and, and Professor Tirumurthy, and uh, team from social, social work team, they're all uh, part of uh, social work uh, or uh, geriatric unit, geriatric psychiatry unit anyway. I also welcome Chandru, who is helping us today. and. Uh, uh, the, the most most importantly, uh, I would like to welcome our uh, guest all the way from Ireland. Dr. Irasim Leroy is no um, uh, new to this place. Uh, probably this is the third or fourth, third time, I think, uh, that she's visited us. And uh, we are honored to have you, ma'am. Um, so welcome you all. Welcome you uh, for this event. And uh, we would be, uh, you know, uh, looking forward to your uh, enlightened uh, presentation. Uh, I would like to, last but not least, but uh, most important people uh, who are our seniors, who are our uh, teachers, uh, Professor Matthew Varghese and uh, Professor Shikala Bharat, we welcome you. As well as uh, I welcome uh, Mr. Bharat, uh, you know, um, uh, you. the other half of uh, um, Madam Shikala Bharat for this better evening. Half, better uh, half, better. <laughs> yeah, I can say better <laughs> half. <laughs> or bitter half. <laughs> You're even better. So, uh, so with this, uh, uh, with this welcome speech, I hand over uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the hand over to the, to the chairpersons, uh, Professor Matthew Varghese and Professor Shikala Bharat. Professor Matthew Varghese, uh, as you all know, that he has been a teacher for a very long time at Nimhans until he retired. Um, uh, almost 18 months back and um, and he's in again in a very active role in several of the institutes across india south india mainly and internationally also um, and doing a lot of projects continuing a lot of projects and all and uh, he's the one who has uh, uh, ensured that ira is with us today so thank you sir um, and uh, also welcome uh, professor shikala bharat she has been a very uh, very uh, Supportive and a very helpful mentor. Anybody uh, who has worked with her will know. Uh, and uh, with that uh, introduction, Madam and uh, Sir, over to you. Yeah. Um, good evening uh, to everyone. Welcome to <coughs> this evening of CME, Continued Medical Education of the Geriatric Unit in uh, NIMHANS. I think the first topic is going to be on from. Uh, training and research through multidisciplinary Discussion collaborations. Is, it, is the voice enough? People, people yeah. Can somebody... yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, for all the people who have joined NIMHANS very recently, it is the main, when you become, today is the world where you specialize and super specialize that the person who looks at the right nostril will not look at the left nostril. When there is more and more specialization, there is more and more isolation. But 
uh, NIMHANS by its own tenet has always been however specialized the training has been, the research has been. It has been multidisciplinary from day one. So we have not only the main clinical units, which are also multidisciplinary, but we are also multidisciplinary in our allied subjects also. So people who have been trained here, when they go to other places, they find it as a surprise that it is not the norm in most of the institutes. Whereas it is the norm in NIMHANS, which we may fail to recognize. And this is an, you know, an opportunity which is not enjoyed by or which is not experienced by most of the people who get trained in psychiatry. Usually in NIMHANS, even the term is not, psychiatry is not used more as mental health. So it is always a collaborative and an interdisciplinary approach rather than just psychiatry approach. So we have had any project or any training is always done as a group from the Department of um, Psychiatry, Department of Clinical Psychology and Department of Psychiatric Social Work. to work very actively. He has actually included more and more disciplines into the training and um, research which is ongoing in the UK. Over to Dr. Vikishwakumar. Thank you, ma'am. I think it is uh, uh, really uh, heartening to have uh, the founders of the geriatric team today. And uh, in, uh, I think we have been trying to have this uh, kind of get together where uh, we will have both of the founders in one room. Uh, it, it has been quite a long wait for us. And today we also have uh, uh, Irasima joining us it's, it's, uh, and the whole team is here. So what I would be doing in the next few minutes, uh, can you share the PPT? Uh, is uh, just give us some kind of overview uh, about uh, uh, how in the, both in the care and training and research, uh, we have been working collaboratively I think uh, this is also something like which uh, many of the participants uh, who are also multidisciplinary, both from medical, psychology, social work, nursing, uh, it is some kind of a orientation as to how uh, the geriatric unit is functioning. As Professor Shikla told, uh, I think this is a kind of a template which we follow in the uh, behavioral sciences uh, in demands. And uh, uh, geriatric unit has tried to strengthen it uh, I think what uh, they both started 20 years back, we have tried to kind of uh, take it uh, uh, further, improve it. And then uh, uh, we started some training courses, uh, which we'll be sharing it in terms of how the services and how things are happening now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Can you go to the next, next slide? Uh, can you? Uh, yes, yes, yes. So uh, I think uh, uh, the aging is something which uh, many of us know that uh, globally this is happening, the changing demography where people are living longer due to increase in life expectancy, decline in mortality rates, and India is not exception to it. And the change that is happening in India is happening much faster uh, compared to many European countries the proportion of elderly may be lesser. We are in the bracket of 10 to 12% in most of the states. And in some states in Northern India, it is still much lesser. But as a country, uh, we are aging much faster. And in the next two decades, we'll be kind of increasing uh, in a, at a rate, which is very, very higher than what uh, the Europe, uh, like uh, France or England, where they grew very slowly. And by the time they grew slowly, they were able to have support services. They were able to have many other developments in terms of healthcare and social care in place. But even there, they face a challenge. But in a country like India, where this change is happening fast, and even now the focus is more on women and child health, pediatrics, <coughs> geriatrics as such is not a primary focus. It's going to be a challenge. Now, 
traditionally india is known to have uh, strength as a social and family support we are a uh, uh, culture which used to have a joint family as the main system and it is uh, uh, very connected but the development uh, brings uh, uh, kind of lot of positive things like women employment and people going abroad migration within the country where a lot of people from rural area comes to the cities and then starts working and also migration abroad many people go abroad and this naturally uh, kind of reduces the available social and family support so this aging is happening in this context and what is probably uh, more uh, important in terms of the lamic countries and uh, countries like india is that we are also affected by a low level of awareness uh, and stigma so i think these two defining things which influences any care systems and it is something very very important for the mental health care system and uh, 20 years back there was a study which looked at a description of a person with dementia and how people can recognize it or not and they found many of them would have seen that but they would think it is a normal aging and the story is still the same in terms of there may be some awareness but still a lot of people think it is a normal for aging and uh, whether it is a depression whether it is dementia this low awareness leads to a significant uh, a kind of reduction in terms of people how many people seek help and stigma again is something which is very very an important factor across the mental health uh, spectrum and uh, elderly is not a, a exception for it and uh, both are something which uh, we as clinicians and uh, multidisciplinary team we need to work on it uh, to kind of improve the services improve the outcomes we need to work on it next so <coughs> the, when we talk of geriatric mental health we in a tertiary care institute uh, when we if we talk of severe mental disorders like dementia or moderate to severe depression uh, or schizophrenia or bipolar disorder we are talking only about the tip of the iceberg the majority of the people are somebody who has common mental disorders like mild depression anxiety uh, which are seen in the general hospitals or primary health care and our primary health care system is more focused on uh, infectious diseases now we are getting into ncds like high diabetes and hypertension there is a focus mental health is still not something addressed maybe some states like karnataka Uh, the mental health program is much more active uh, even there it is at the level of taluk hospitals and district hospitals we are having a district mental health program where people are being seen in a camp mode at a primary health care center level we do train a lot of people but still the integration is much much lesser when we talk of mental health in elderly a large proportion of them have what is called as a sub syndromal mental health issues whether it is a depression anxiety cognitive impairment these are people who may not have diagnosable health conditions but they have a, a problem which has a good impact significant impact on functioning as well as well being and now the, uh, there is good evidence that there we have to focus on this population also to promote healthy aging and also to prevent mental health conditions there is something called as indicated prevention uh it, the people who are having sub syndromal mental health issues bec- are becoming the important focus so these population are not seen in the clinics like nimans we need to outreach to community and we need to network and there uh, the multidisciplinary team doesn't belong to experts or so called professionals in mental health we need to look at uh, collaborating with health workers collaborating with the public health system collaborating with ngos and collaborating with the senior citizens themselves as a stakeholders and that's when we can actually reach to them next so more than 90% treatment gap for mental health problems across the life spectrum i think probably more in elderly uh, when we look at conditions like dementia uh, uh, the treatment gap is very high now the common mental health conditions which we see uh, in elderly i think uh, uh, the most important thing is depression anxiety and dementia and delirium so there is a good amount of data available uh, 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 in uh, assist, uh, kind of uh, studies from lassi longitudinal aging study of india which actually uh, gives 
uh, a good amount of data across the country at a state level. So uh, we know uh, almost 8% uh, of people have uh, depression. And a recent data from uh, Lassie Dad uh, study, which uh, Dr. Matthew was and our team was also part of it, uh, which has actually shown uh, a prevalence of dementia as 8.8%. Almost uh, 8 million people are supposed to have dementia. And uh, anxiety and delirium, again, is important. A lot of people, even with chronic mental disorders like substance abuse, psychosis, uh, bipolar, live now with the better care facilities available. Uh, they are also living longer. And we do see those people who have chronic mental illness also, part of some of them uh, kind of get into our service. Next. So the challenges with respect to geriatric mental health, uh, 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 what we need to understand is, uh, I have just put it as four Cs, the complexity. I think uh, many of these things we diagnose depression in the same way as we diagnose in younger people. The, uh, but the clinical presentation can be complex, both in terms of, uh, uh, it may be having atypical presentation, people may not complain of sadness, people may have irritability as a more important thing, or they may remain more withdrawn and apathetic. Uh, and then, so these are atypical presentations. Complexity is also in the context of a uh, lot of psychosocial issues that is happening, and the stressors, different stressors that is happening. Comorbidity, again, both medical comorbidities, psychiatric comorbidity. When we talk of comorbidity in terms of cognitive impairment, sensory impairment, which Irasima will be addressing as to how it is an important thing like hearing and vision. Uh, still, a lot of people uh, have uh, uncorrected hearing impairment, uncorrected vision impairment. I think hearing impairment is phenomenal in the sense that people get used to live with it. They don't think it is a problem which can be corrected. And the solutions what we are giving, people don't sustain to it. A lot of people, somebody buys a hearing aid and then keeps it in the, in the, in the cupboard and then they don't use it. So these are comorbidities where we need to address and provide an integrated caregiver. When it comes to geriatric caregiver, our focus is not only the patients, the caregiver becomes an important focus, whether it is depression, whether it is dementia. We do have uh, our multidisciplinary team uh, is required to address the issues of caregivers. That is why the social work and psychology, nursing, all of them have an important role. And uh, caregiver interventions uh, can promote well-being, can promote uh, a good quality of care. Uh, when we talk of caregiver, it is not only the family caregiver, it is very, very common and uh, uh, a, a increasing practice where we have professional caregivers or paid caregivers who become an important uh, source of support for taking care of our elderly. And again, that is something a caregiver group where we need to train people. So with all these things, when it comes to geriatric care, cost again is an important factor. One, a lot of elderly people don't have social security benefits, don't have insurance, don't have, they are quite, uh, many of them uh, are dependent on the family members for their financial support systems. That has an impact on how they are brought to the hospital in terms of ensuring a follow-up, ensuring the continuity of care. It is also indirect cost. Many times a family member who's taking care of a person with dementia has to give up their job and then provide 24 by seven care. They may not be able to afford a paid caregiver. And <clears throat> so the cost is not only about the treatment cost, the cost is about the indirect cost. Because I think Dr. Sikala had done a study estimating the cost burden in dementia. And uh, compared to developed countries, the, the, the cost in terms of income expenditure, uh, the expenditure that is happening, they, they may, because of the cost of the, uh, the job, uh, how much wage is being given in India, it may look low, but there's a lot of indirect costs, which is, I think, equally important. And the burden is no different from uh, the, what, was, what is documented in the Western or the developed countries. Next. So <laughs> where we are providing the geriatric mental health care, again, uh, ideally the care should be available in the community. Uh, uh, if, if, if many of the developed countries provide care and the home, ideal, uh, actually the first evaluation and as well as the follow-up evaluation, people need to be supported in the home. I think this is one area where in our systems, uh, it is not available or not affordable and accessible for many of them. Only very few 
uh, doctors would go to the home and uh, uh, the organized service in terms of home care is quite limited during covid something started and even we do make home visits our team make home visits on request but we are not able to provide a service uh, on a regular basis where we can support at home and this is an area where uh, many of us are exploring op opportunities uh, by strengthening our team and as well as getting an adequate support we may be able to offer it uh, uh, in the home uh, at least for some people and again when we train our people i think that kind of exposure is very much required and healthcare settings uh, many times in indian settings it is happening in the specialist settings so integration of mental health and uh, geriatric mental health is not happening at a primary care level and secondary care level so it, people have uh, multiple prescriptions that becomes a big challenge where the caregiver has a uh, challenge of combining all the prescription there are a lot of duplications and prescription errors happens because of that it is not like an nhs system where uh, everything is routed through a gp or a primary care physician who integrates all the things so uh, I, i think that is again Uh, the concept who is promoting is integrated care for older people and uh, the concept of family physicians taking care of a primary care physician taking care of everything is something still not implemented that much the other uh, important uh, thing where uh, probably required at a lesser level but still it's very very important is the social care both in terms of uh, support at home for people who cannot take care of themselves the lassie study shown that almost one fourth of people required some assistance for uh, basic activities of daily living and uh, nearly 50% had challenges in complex activities of daily living they required some sort of assistance in our culture still there is a joint family system happening in many places at least the children will be living nearby or in the same building uh, many of their paying bills are uh, say uh, doing transactions or taken care of the family so the only when they actually have impairment in the basic activities they realize there is a problem and it is accepted that people need not cook people need not uh, travel on their own people need not manage their own affairs uh, uh, by themselves so the uh, the what is shown in the uh, structured assessments when we go to the uh, when we do in a study like lasi and what we people perceive is quite different so there is a large proportion of them have deficits and this is something uh, uh, the long term care systems is something which is very very limited uh, development is available and what is available is very expensive and inaccessible uh, for many people uh, who don't have support systems who don't have financial support systems and some ngos are trying to provide support for destitute care but again they have uh, a limited availability next yeah so just to give a background of what we have been doing and where we are today i think uh, 20 years back uh, in uh, i think 99 end and 2000 beginning is what we have the record as when the clinic the geriatric clinic started formally uh, dr matthew vergis and sikla bharat had the vision to start the clinic at that point of time and then uh, we uh, were running on a saturday afternoon which will uh, go very late in the evening and at, at some point of time we had more than 100 up to 150 people uh, waiting from morning and then we finishing our work by around 8 pm so that was there and when the training started i think we started uh, becoming uh, uh, we started working on a full time unit and that's when uh, in 2017 the dm course was initiated and that's when professor matthew was the head of the uh, full time uh, geriatric psychiatry unit and i was Uh, 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 as, uh, I was able to join as a full-time consultant at that point of time. So we have grown. Um, I think a lot of work has been done by Dr. Matthew and Srikala. Uh, but for them, uh, we would not have had that uh, kind of uh, uh, experience and expertise uh, and the kind of collaborations what they have developed. We still uh, bank on them and continue. And further, we have been growing uh, with all the kind of things that is uh, uh, what they had established. and in a way this meeting and this today's this thing is to kind of uh, recollection and uh, also honoring them so uh, I, i take this opportunity to thank them for uh, putting all this background work so that we can actually build on it next and uh, so the core team uh, of our unit uh, is psychiatry psychiatric social work which i think i should thank dr trimurthy uh, for being a support from the beginning when in 2017 when we started 
uh, I think social work became integrated as a regular full time uh, unit uh, uh, team, multidisciplinary team, and their students and social, uh, PhD scholars became our uh, team members. And then uh, it was very, very helpful for us to uh, improve the service. And clinical psychology, we have just had a part time involvement. And again, it is improving now with the faculty uh, being available. And nursing, again, is something very, very important. But because of their constraints, they have not been able to involve as a full-time uh, service. But we have been fortunate to have a fellowship course for uh, geriatric mental health nursing. And that way, we are able to kind of get a multidisciplinary team. And a lot of other collaborations ranging from neuroimaging to neurology, integrative medicine. Again, we work very closely with integrative medicine. And uh, it's a new department which uh, uh, kind of, uh, I think the program is happening here in the integrative medicine department. And not only that, a uh, uh, lot of elderly use integrative medicine, uh, yoga and Ayurveda, something which is very commonly uh, used for many conditions. And speech pathology, uh, audiology, again, is an important uh, kind of service, which helps us. A lot of basic sciences like genetics, neurochemistry, and neurophysiology, again, is a collaborating. Uh, we have been getting their inputs for clinical services also. For example, genetics. We have started doing clinical exome sequencing, whole exome sequencing, uh, where people are able to uh, kind of even identify rare conditions uh, currently. I think the services which was there as primarily as research earlier has actually progressed now to have some uh, rare conditions we are able to use it for clinical <coughs> service. Biomarkers, again, we are in the verge of kind of maybe near, near future we'll be having services where we can do biomarkers as part of clinical service. We'll, uh, maybe in the next few years we should be available. And neurophysiology, we use them for uh, sleep studies. Uh, we, they have collaborated for some patients. I think the collaboration is still strengthening. And Center for Public Health uh, have been a partner where in many public health outreach initiatives, they have been part of it. Non-governmental organizations, several non-governmental organizations are very important. And physiotherapy, as we have used, and legal services where we are able to provide uh, kind of a free legal services clinic for senior citizens is available. Next. So I, I'm, I'm just highlighting these things because any potential trainee and potential people who come into our service, uh, our, our team can get exposure to all these aspects. And uh, I think that today we were having discussion about how a multidisciplinary team, uh, multidisciplinary uh, expertise is important for brain aging and dementia. And I think that is what we have been doing it from the beginning. And I think still a long way to go. So just a brief about service. I think this is available on a, uh, we, uh, we have a first contact OPD on a daily basis. We also run a detailed OPD on Tuesday and follow up OPD on Wednesday. And uh, a dementia clinic uh, on Saturday still, we predominantly see people with dementia on Saturday, but even though we see on them on other days also. And emergency services, again, uh, is available on every day. Acute inpatient care services is available. We see around 20 to 25 patients as inpatients at any point of time. And these are people who are admitted with dementia for diagnosis or BPSD or depression. Predominantly, many of them are severe depression uh, who get ECTs and uh, other psychiatric disorders, delirium. These are things which are commonly admitted as inpatients. Next. So uh, I think neuromodulation, uh, Dr. Preeti uh, is one of the key faculty there in the ECT services. And uh, we also, uh, I think geriatric population uh, per se, many of them, they respond very well in terms of depression, as well as in severe BPSDs when the environmental uh, support and the behavioral management is not uh, helpful. We uh, have even tried ECTs uh, for management of severe aggression. And uh, TDCS and TMS, again, is something which is our strength and we have a collaborators. We, uh, uh, we use it both in terms of cognitive disorders, TDCS, where uh, we have uh, uh, done both in terms of research as well as clean, clinical service we are providing. And RTMS again is available for people with depression as well as in cognitive disorders we use them. And psychosocial support services, both in terms of uh, support group or online support group or uh, individual group, uh, individual interventions and group interventions uh, are done by uh, both the social work team and psychology. <clears throat> and uh, uh, the tele, uh, a neuropsychological assessment, we have a separate team, which they do, as well as uh, we have in house, we do, uh, I think it's integrated within our clinical practice. So, both uh, Adam Brooks and uh, HMSC, as well as uh, the demands neuropsychological battery, which is done by the neuropsychology team. 
uh, is being used. And uh, COVID uh, kind of gave impetus to telepsychiatry and telepsychiatry we actually started even before COVID. And uh, we were one of the earlier teams, earliest to kind of use that effectively to for improving the follow-up rate. And uh, recognizing that old age homes are very, very important for uh, persons with uh, psychiatric illness in elderly, we do outreach services in <laughs> destitute old age homes. And uh, many requests, we kind of, we go and do a screening camp and we provide uh, uh, tele-support for them as much as possible. Next. So as, uh, around 3,000 new patients and uh, uh, follow-up consultations, 6,000 plus and 300 admissions. Uh, we do provide support for 100 plus people in a destitute old age home on a regular basis and around 300 plus emergency <laughs> visits. This is in one year. Predominantly people from uh, 60 to 69, even though we see dementia less than 60, uh, early onset dementia also we see, and male and female are equal. So uh, I think this is one area where you know prevalence is more in female, but I think the number of people who come to service is still male is much more. Uh, uh, I think female uh, patients are not brought that much for clinical service. Possibly that is one reason why the wish is not uh, kind of more female. So next. And uh, dementia and depression uh, being the main group of conditions which we see. Next. So uh, I, I think the uh, we are working on enhancing the community outreach services and both the caregiver support as well as a specialized dementia care unit, which is almost ready. And maybe in the next six months to one year, it will become uh, operational uh, 12 bed unit. And uh, a center for dementia care, which will offer long-term care in Sakalwara is uh, we are trying to work on getting a support and building that. A daycare, again, is something which is in our plan. We have been proposing in many fire plans we have proposed. Still, it is we have not been able to have on our own, but we collaborate with the NGO partner and then uh, use that as a service for our patients as well as for our training. And uh, geriatric medicine and consultation license is something in area where we are working on to improve. Next. So the whole aim uh, is to kind of uh, further improvement in terms of ensuring minimum clinical standards. Being a large team, uh, I think this is somewhere where our team, I think primarily our team is here today. We need to work on improving the clinical standards and adhering to the standards as much as possible because it's a training unit. A lot of people come and go. How do we ensure this is something which we need. We are working on it. And as a whole, we need to build the ethos and build this kind of thing. I think the, what we stand for is elderly friendly clinical services. Each one of our team, when we uh, interact with the people, I think we need to uphold it. And I think that is something which is our, uh, which is, which is uh, something which is appreciated by people and demand stands for it. And our team is, uh, again, uh, we should improve on it to make sure as to how we can uh, make it much more friendly for service, uh, for the people. And improving the continuity of care <clears throat> and improving, uh, I think the follow-up is a big challenge because I think a lot of people drop out because of the distance, because of difficulty in bringing elderly for follow-up. And outreach to follow them up at homes is something which we are looking at, at least for people in Bangalore. And tele-follow-up, we need to further improve uh, so that we can do it, uh, ensure the continuity of care and improving access to non-pharmacological interventions. Still, with all these resources available, how many of them get a systematic non-pharmacological interventions? Uh, it is about, uh, provide. I think language is a complexity, and also time in terms of how much we can actually deliver. I think this is a global challenge. We are not ex uh, uh, kind of, uh, 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 it's, it's not, we are not an exception. We are also looking at how task sharing can be used. Uh, training uh, volunteers, training other people uh, to kind of uh, strengthen our resources and uh, trying to improve the access to that. Next. So in terms of training, uh, I think uh, training is an important mandate for us. Next. So various courses we have started both for psychiatry. I think 2014, we started PDF, then subsequently DM, just three-year course. And also the courses for fellowship courses for MBBS, for psychology background, which is very, very important in terms of psychology and social work. One-year fellowship is available. And uh, the, for nursing, post-MSc psychiatric nursing is again available. And uh, we are also trying to see even general nursing, people who are in master degree in other nursing, uh, probably we can take it. Because I think geriatric care, geriatric mental health care is important for not only people with psychiatric nursing, people with other nursing backgrounds also. Next one. 
So all these courses offer uh, exposure to train in a multidisciplinary <laughs> team and also uh, exposure to a complete range of geriatric mental health issues and various settings where within our in-house and demands as well as through our collaborators, through our partners and uh, outreach, a lot of outreach. Our fellowship students are involved in training nurses, training uh, community health, uh, training volunteers and a uh, lot of outreach things and also learning research methodology and publication and guidance and mentoring for a career in genetic mental health. This is something what we are looking at. And when we say task sharing and looking at people uh, who are uh, not a professional uh, thing for mental health, we are looking at training geriatric caregivers that we had done with CSR support and also training physicians, uh, which again, we are doing it uh, partner uh, with uh, one of the charitable trust uh, initiative. And we also collaborated with Irasima as part of the EDASA program where uh, multidisciplinary people were getting trained from uh, uh, say a team of professionals uh, from across the uh, uh, globe. I think that's again another initiative which I've not listed here. And Alzheimer Seva is an initiative where we are training volunteers uh, to go on screen and also educate. This is again an ongoing initiative. Next. So uh, we are trying to create a learning forum. I think this is something we are discussing and through a learning portal to kind of, because the fellowship courses are only few seat seats, lot, many people cannot get the opportunity to come and train full time. So we are trying to see as to how we can engage people and provide some mentoring for a period of time for people with from various backgrounds. This is something we are planning. Next. So uh, coming to research, I think there are lots of research projects which are doing. I just wanted to share about few important research projects, which uh, 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 either uh, I think the ADBS project is one of the landmark project, which Dr. Matthew was one of the key persons and uh, which looks at cutting across disorders where dementia is one part and uh, other psychiatric disorders like OCD, schizophrenia, bipolar, uh, and looking at the neurobiology and, uh, uh, and uh, various aspects, genetics and imaging, various aspects across the disorders. And looking at first degree relatives and looking at uh, what is going to happen in the long term. And that, that has been the main focus there. I, and the, the important project which we are going to start uh, in February 9th is going to be launched, uh, where uh, my collaborator, Dr. Uh, John, is a primary principal investigator and Venkat. Uh, this is in partnership with the University of Southern California, India Enigma Initiative for Global Age in Aging and Mental Health. And this is a five year project where we're looking at brain aging, uh, looking at uh, MRI and uh, looking at various measures like from proteomics to genetics. Uh, I think this is going to be a very important opportunity for us to also train people. I think many, I think training is one of the important and capacity building is important aspect of this project. Paul Thompson, who uh, holds the Enigma consortiums in many disorders. He's a, a PA from University of Southern California. And uh, Yentra program, which again is another program, which is a Ministry of Ayush funded program which again is a program which cutting across many disorders of which Alzheimer's is one uh, component of it. Again, looking at a huge bio repository, uh, looking at understanding the uh, phenotype of uh, what traditionally the Ayurveda systems look at and how it is linked to the brain, how it is linked to the biology, both in terms of genetics and imaging. And this is an important project, which is again starting now. Uh, and LASI is another important project which is a very important. Lassie Dad is another important project. Dr. Matthew is there. And these are some of the key things. Next. So there are lots of dissertations which our people are doing. I won't go into the details. I think ranging from biomarkers to TDCS, wandering uh, uh, and uh, uh, support groups, uh, a cognitive intervention. Next. So these are all the range of work, what uh, health, uh, strength-based healthy aging program. These are all doctoral research programs or DM thesis, which our team is doing. Next. And outreach initiatives, uh, I'll just sum up in uh, two few minutes. Next. I think this uh, one of the important initiatives was Age Friendly Karnataka in collaboration with the Legal Services Authority, uh, which uh, has been uh, going on. And the next one is a Vayum Anasa Sanjeevani. This is a flagship program, what we have been doing for the couple of years, where we have kind of uh, uh, brought together all the outreach activities, ranging from the age-friendly community to promoting awareness and training of lay, uh, volunteers and providing interventions in old age homes and outreach uh, kind of camps there. 
integrative medicine, promoting integrative medicine for healthy aging, as well as daily psychiatric services. All these are important focus for us, and which has been going on for the last couple of years with the support of a lot of people and partners. Uh, this is one activity which is very important for us. Next. And our team is actively involved in all these things. Every uh, Monday's webinars are conducted both in the local language, Canada and English, and also in other languages like Tamil, it is being done. Engagement programs are done uh, on Saturdays, uh, alternate Saturdays. Volunteering uh, training and internships are done for volunteers from multidisciplinary uh, expertise, uh, different fields. Uh, we are collaborating with two colleges, Christ University, where there's a psychology in health and well-being psychology, as well as Jane University. Their students have been engaged with us, and then they're doing this internship, uh, uh, both in terms of as a volunteering program. And uh, we also uh, talked about the Sandhya Suraksha and Sandhya Kirana, which is the old age homes where we are providing the support. Next. So this is an uh, initiative for training doctors, which Dr. Preeti is leading with the Project ECHO uh, on dementia training uh, for general physicians. Next. And Alzheimer's Seva is a volunteering program where almost around 500 people we have screened in the last two months. And we have got the support uh, approval from the health uh, department of Karnataka to kind of screen uh, in three districts as of now. And, uh, train, and train the community health officers uh, so that they can identify persons with cognitive problems uh, in their community. Next. And also educate them about healthy aging. So the caregiver education, we have trained uh, 188 people we have certified. Uh, both in Again, this is a program. Uh, we look for support to start again uh, in the next batch. We uh, uh, want to continue and expand this. Uh, this was a primarily an online and a, a brief in-person component was there. Next. And with a, one of the leading NGOs, we have just announced a program uh, to train 10,000 people in a year. Uh, this is called as a Sarthak. Uh, Help Age India is a global, uh, globally re renowned organization which uh, has its presence in, across all the states. And uh, along with the National Program for Healthcare of Elderly, uh, we are looking to uh, promote mental well-being by training a lot of stakeholders. Next. And uh, Vaya Vikas is an organization, uh, again, trying to spread across the country. We have entered into a partnership with them, again, to reach out to a lot of senior citizens and promote uh, volunteering and promote active engagement. Because uh, we, as a clinical unit, we cannot actually get active partnership without collaborations and networking. So that is something very, very important for us. Next. And uh, I, I think the, our trainees are getting exposed to uh, residential care, how uh, support is provided. And, and almost, I think, half of them in this destitute care home have mental health conditions like dementia and psychosis. Many of them are wandering people who have been brought by police. And it is good for us to provide support. Next. So one of the important uh, things, next, I think, uh, I think uh, we have to uh, uh, acknowledge Professor Sia Chandrasekhar. Uh, who was uh, 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 who had donated one crore actually for the maintenance expenditure for the upcoming dementia care facility in Sakalwara. And uh, I think we are indebted to him for uh, providing the support. Next. And uh, our service has been recognized both the national award and state award and uh, by the government. Next. And so I'll stop here. I think uh, this is just to give an overview as to how our team has been doing this and uh, we look forward for active participation from various uh, stakeholders uh, today attending the program uh, to kind of connect with us and then i think the fellowship courses i think uh, is a very very important thing where uh, social work psychology and nursing uh, uh, people can have opportunity to kind of become part of our team uh, we can train and also in our community outreach initiatives and bioman Bio sanjeevani uh, I think we welcome volunteers to participate and so that uh, we can uh, join hands and enhance the service and enhance the training, enhance the support. I think without uh, joining hands and networking and working for this cause, we, we will uh, just be able to provide service to only a few people. I think this way we can reach out to a large number of people. I think this, I, I, I take uh, this opportunity to thank the, my whole team uh, of consultants as well as my uh, senior residents and our multidisciplinary team, as well as our founders, uh, who have inspired us to do these activities. Thank you very much.
questions in the episode. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Shivkumar. It's uh, always good to come back here and uh, listen to all the uh, dynamic and more and more advancing and uh, expanding work that all of you do. Uh, it's, it's always also good to do a kind of annual recap like we're doing now and to review and to get <coughs> ideas about what to do next and also collaborate with the whole uh, sort of network of people involved with uh, old age care. I always say uh, for doing geriatric psychiatry, you really have to be a jack of all trades and a master of one. And, and, and you, the old age, persons with old age problems cannot go to uh, many, many doctors and specialists. They have to come to you and you are the one-stop shop. So whatever you do, whoever it is is doing it, you know, you'll have to really function like that. Um, so uh, we're going to have a questions in the end, so please we'll put them in the chat. And um, I'd like to next call upon uh, the, uh, our visitor and uh, our next speaker, Professor Irasima Leroy. Um, Professor Irasima Leroy was uh, introduced to us by uh, Vijay, Dr. Vijay, who knew her earlier in the UK. And uh, we sort of uh, known her from over 2018 onwards. And uh, it's been a very good uh, association with her. We've done a couple of projects with her. The SenseCorp, which she's going to talk about, is going to be one of them. Uh, Professor Leroy was uh, trained in geriatric psychiatry, both in Canada and then in the United States at Johns Hopkins. And then she spent uh, some time as a professor of psychiatry in... Not audible? Uh, you can't hear me? You want to push the... Uh, no, it's okay. I think Shukma is audible. I don't know. Are you, can you hear me now? <laughs> Just, Just you somebody say, put up their hand somebody, and say, can you hear me now? can go to that other view. But somebody who's there at online. Honey, that person's name no, was Priyamani? We can hear you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, Professor uh, Leroy uh, spent some time working uh, in the University of Manchester doing direct psychiatry. And then in the last few years, she took up a position in uh, Trinity College in Dublin and also a position at the Global Brain Health Institute in Dublin. So uh, Professor Leroy's interest is uh, mainly in dementia, so in clinical trials, and doing all kinds of work in the area of dementia. And also, she's also interested in uh, Parkinson's disease and uh, dementia is associated with Parkinson's disease. So I will uh, let her tell you about uh, her topic, which is eyes, ears, and mind, sensory, cognitive, and health for older people. Professor Leroy. Um, thank you very much for the show. Um, so first of all, thanks, uh, thanks so much to the invitation to be here. It's a tremendous honor. And um, it's, uh, as we just said, it's my third time here and we go by way back to Manchester. So it's lovely coming full circle and seeing all friends like yourself and PT and Matthew. And I've spent the last few days going around um, all the way from Dhaka to Chennai and now up to Bangalore, talking to people and exploring ideas about how to further the agenda in collaboration for brain health and dementia prevention. So this talk does touch on some of those issues. It also fits very nicely with this idea of multidisciplinarity, which you've just been talking about. And I'd just like to take the opportunity to congratulate on the amazing work you've done and um, the energy and how you've built up the department from the origin to what you have now. It's really fantastic. So congratulations and keep up the good work. Okay, so um, in the next half an hour or so, and maybe somebody can keep time and shut me up if I keep going, because <laughs> I know you're all tired, you've had a long day. I'm gonna be touching on hearing, hearing and visual rehabilitation and support to improve outcomes in dementia. Now, I'm absolutely not a hearing expert. I'm not a vision expert. I'm just a, you know, a, a garden variety geriatric psychiatrist working in a memory clinic. But one of the reasons I decided not to go into geriatrics and geriatric psychiatry in the beginning was because I found my older patients couldn't hear me and they ended up shouting all the time. But I went into the field nonetheless. And sure enough, here I am working in this area of hearing impairment and vision impairment in the context of dementia. So I hope you'll find what I have to say of interest. Next slide, please. 
<laughs> um, much of what I will say is based on the SenseCog research program, which is something I've been leading for the past five years. It just recently completed. And this is funded by the European Commission. And it's involved eight different EU countries, numbers of investigators, some industry partners. And it's had multiple tiers, multiple work packages, including looking at the epidemiology, understanding the relation between hearing, vision, and cognitive loss using multiple different data sets, like the English Longitudinal Study of Aging, the Rotterdam Study of Aging. It also had a work package in which we looked at adapting clinical tools for assessment of cognition for hearing and impairment, like the marker, for example, because as everybody who does psychological tests know, we're absolutely dependent on hearing and vision. And if those don't work, the validity of our tests go down. So that's important work that we've been doing. We've also looked at the health economics of the issue as another work package, and also looked at a large clinical trial looking at hearing and vision and uh, in the context of dementia. So that's mostly what I'll be talking about today. But I'll first set the context a little bit. Next slide, please. So for those of you who are looking for projects and looking for areas to move into, this idea of sensory cognitive health is still very new, but it's growing rapidly. When we started SenseCog five, six years ago, hardly anybody talked about it. And now it's a thing. And this beautiful review paper by Danielle Powell talks about where some of the key research gaps are. I'll briefly summarize. First of all, mechanism. How are these things related? The evidence says that they are, but is it to do with sensory deprivation, information degradation, or other different mechanisms, which I'll just touch on later. I've mentioned the issue of measurement. How valid are the usual measurements that we use if people have sensory deficits? And likewise, looking at hearing and vision impairment in a person with cognitive impairment and the validity of those kinds of assessments. And then of course, treatment. So many questions about treatment. Does it work? When does it work? Should we amplify it or should we not? And which key um, period of time is this important? Next slide, please. So let me start by setting the scene. I think, Peter, you've already mentioned this about the high rate of hearing loss within our population of older patients. This is from a memory clinic in Manchester, 2003, by my colleague, Harry Allen. PJ, if you remember, do you remember Harry Allen at all? It goes way back. Now, what he found is doing an audit of the clinic that over 80% of people coming to a memory clinic had unidentified clinically significant hearing impairment. And of those that had identified hearing impairment, very few had hearing aids. If they had hearing aids, they didn't wear them. So a huge problem. Now, we've repeated this audit more recently, 2018, and guess what? Our results were the same. I'm embarrassed to say we haven't learned the lesson. We haven't changed our practice. Now, finally, we're doing hearing screening within our memory clinic. It takes all of two minutes, very low skill kind of thing to do. But the point is, I think these data are stark. Next slide, please. What about vision? Vision isn't quite as bad. About a quarter of people living with dementia have unaddressed or undercorrected vision impairment. Now, if we think of the wide availability of glasses, cataract surgery and so on, that's still a high proportion. And these data come from the PROVIDE study, which is a very nice cross-sectional prevalence study of vision impairment in people living with dementia in various contexts clinical context, living at home, led by Michael Bowen from the Royal College of Optometrists. Now, what's important about those quarter of people is that more than half of them are potentially correctable with either fixing their glasses, getting the right prescription, or cataract surgery. In other words, in interventions that are easy to do and that older people should have the right to get. Next slide, please. Why is this important? Who cares? Well, the evidence is building very rapidly that if you have sensory impairment in the context of dementia, you'll have more rapid cognitive and functional decline. Challenging behaviors will be exaggerated, often leading to excess use of antipsychotics, which are a huge issue for us. Depression can be worse, communication barriers, greater dependency, care of burnout, and overall reduced quality of life, not only for the person with dementia, but also their care partner. Next slide, please. Okay, let's just touch on the evidence linking hearing and cognitive impairment. Next slide, please. So first of all, I'll just refer you to this lovely paper by one of our fellows from the Global Brain Health Institute, David Loffrey. He himself is living with uh, deafness. And he did this lovely meta-analysis of 36 cross-sectional studies using objective measures of hearing impairment. 
Most hearing impairment and longitudinal studies of aging are self-report. It's only the more recent waves that have started to get objective measures. And as you can see, significant associations between various things. Hearing loss and cognitive impairment, sorry, performance, how you perform on tests. No surprise, we know that from our clinical practice. Hearing loss and cognitive impairment, hearing loss and dementia. I'll take you through each of those. Next slide, please. Okay, this is hot off the press. This beautiful review paper um, by Yo and colleagues. And this is from 2023, a meta-analysis of a number of studies looking at the association between hearing restoration and short-term cognitive test score changes, all right? So that's change in test score. And as you can see, there's a 3% improvement. So gives us a reasonable indication. Next slide, please. Oops, missed a slide. Oh, never mind. Anyway, there's some longer term changes as well. I think I've lost a slide. No, and in fact, it'll come. I'm making a point here. This is an old study that looks at MMSC scores based on hearing level. Uh, advanced? Just, uh, just push advanced? Yep. And again, and one more time. Perfect. So, oh, no, just want to stop. stop. <laughs> so what this clearly demonstrates, the more hearing impaired you are, the worse you'll perform cognitively. Very basic and what we know from our clinical practice. Next slide, please. Okay, here's the second one of that same meta-analysis. So the point here is a meta-analysis of these eight studies showed nearly a 20% lower hazard of any cognitive decline in hearing aid users versus people with uncorrected hearing loss. So this is some interesting and good evidence. Next slide, please. What about the sense copy evidence? What did we demonstrate? Okay, now this is across multiple different large-scale longitudinal studies of aging, like LASI, but they've been longer established. ELSE has been around for 20 years, at the English Longitudinal Study of Aging. HRS is the Health and Retirement Survey from America. SHARE is the European metadata set, which brings a number of these large data sets together. And essentially, you're seeing the same thing, aren't you? Black line at the top is your expected trajectory of cognitive decline with aging. The red line is that trajectory, which is exaggerated if you have hearing impairment. Okay? So a pretty strong message across all these large scale data sets. Next study, please. Same with vision. Now, as you will all know from working with older people, few people have hearing alone or vision alone. Most people have combined. So is there an additive effect? Next slide, please. So what the data show here, the blue line is having single modality uh, sensory loss. The red line is dual sensory loss. So adding vision and hearing together, and you have a more rapid decline in cognitive impairment. Next slide, please. What about dementia? Same pattern. So previously you looked at cognitive impairment with aging. Now we're actually looking at moving into the clinical syndrome of dementia, and it is more rapid. So you can see there, the red line always is the sensory impairment compared to intact uh, sensory function. And this work has been led by Asri, my lovely colleague Asri, Masri Maharani. So coming from Jill Livingston's 2017 Lancet Commission, in that paper they showed, bringing all the data together, a nearly two times greater risk of incident <laughs> and hearing loss individuals are greater than 55 versus non-hearing loss. An important point here is that these are young people. These are, well, relative to some of you anyway. <laughs> so these are mid, this is about mid-life hearing loss is the important risk factor. Next slide, please. What are the mechanisms linking hearing and cognitive impairment? Now, there's some number of hypotheses mechanisms. Here we're talking about both peripheral hearing loss and central auditory function. And it's extremely difficult to tease those apart. If we have neurodegeneration, say due to Alzheimer's disease, there's going to be a degree of central dysfunction. But largely where we're doing much of the work is with peripheral hearing loss. So that will be the focus of many of my remarks. Next slide, please. This is a beautiful paper, How Can Hearing Loss Cause Dementia? Led by Tim Griffiths from Newcastle from a couple of years ago, looking at peripheral auditory function and its relation with cognitive loss. And I'll just go through some of the models that he proposed. So first of all, in for the information degradation hypothesis, sensory deprivation hypothesis, and common cause hypothesis. Go through each of those. First of all, information degradation. The point here is that if you have struggled to hear, 
you need to apply greater cognitive resources to decode the message. That robs other areas of the brain, your other cognitive functions, for example, those that would be used to lay down memories. In other words, this idea of increased listening effort, cognitive fatigue. Next slide, please. And next slide, please. Sensory deprivation. Here's another model. The idea of use it or lose it. If you've got impoverished sensory input, the idea is that you develop disuse atrophy in areas that are related to those sensory areas. Next slide, please. Next, so just, we'll just keep advancing here. Next, next slide, yeah, perfect. And finally, the common cause hypothesis, which is likely the case in most older people who have multimorbidity and co-pathology. Think, for example, hypertension, diabetes, and the increased risk of developing aging-related hearing loss. But likewise, again, that's those same factors driving neurodegeneration leading to Alzheimer's disease and, and other forms of neurodegeneration. So you've got these kind of forces moving in parallel, leading to comorbidity, morbidity. Okay, let me just focus now back on this idea of sensory deprivation for a second. I talked about the direct association. But what about indirect associations? You can also struggle because the sensory impairment leads to depression, loss of self-efficacy, decreased physical activity, all of which are risk factors for developing dementia. Also, we know that as you start having developing hearing loss and sensory impairment, your social circle diminishes, as it does indeed with developing dementia. Your world shrinks. So just looking at that particular question, next, next slide, please. We decided to look at this using ELSA data as part of the SenseCog program. Next slide, please. And we wanted to model this idea. How much of this is the direct pathway versus the indirect pathway? And what Asri was able to do was to demonstrate that yes, indeed, hearing loss and memory are linked. So is loneliness and memory loss. So is social isolation and memory loss. None of that's new. But what we see here is that hearing loss also works indirectly through loneliness to cause episodic memory changes and through social isolation. So what? Okay, what this means to me is that if we address hearing loss alone, we're only getting part of the problem solved. What we have to do is also address the secondary consequences like the social isolation and the loneliness that may also be associated. Again, coming back to PT's idea of this multifactorial, multidisciplinary input. We can't be isolating out these simple problems, single problems. Next slide, please. Oh, this, I just popped this in because this is a very interesting, um, some interesting work looking at songbirds that are socially isolated. It actually changes the auditory cortex through plasticity and changes their ability to interpret the songs of their species. In other words, sensory deprivation changes cortical activity and cognitive function. Next slide, please. Sorry, just going back to that issue. I think, I mean, as you all know, COVID has been the most dramatic sort of natural experiment that we can ever have in society of the impact of social isolation and loneliness on older people. And you've all in probably in your clinic seen people say with mild cognitive impairment, mild dementia, who literally come back after COVID and the fallen off the cliff. The huge declines, unprecedented declines, both in physical health, mental health and cognitive health. Again, a large part of that social isolation and lack of stimulation. Okay, so, Sorry, just go back a slide. Let's talk about prevention. Primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention. Next slide, please. Okay, so the first point here is many of you, if not all of you, will be extremely familiar with this Lancet Commission paper by Jill Livingston from 2020, which looked at the 12 risk factors of potentially reversible lifestyle factors that if addressed, can address 40% of dementia. And the evidence has suggested that here in South Asia, that's up to 50%, which is huge. Now, these are theoretical models, and we've yet to test them, but that's absolutely huge. I mean, that's well on the way to cracking the problem, the future problem of prevention, by addressing these essentially simple things. So let's just go through them. <coughs> Education of 12 years. Next one. Just flip down. Yeah. We all know these. Hypertension, obesity, diabetes, alcohol use. Traumatic brain injury, late life depression, physical inactivity, smoking, 
air quality, a huge one. A beautiful review on that issue just came out from Minachandra this year, or the last year at least, um, looking at air quality studies and, and, and uh, risk of um, dementia. Social isolation is accounts for 3.5% of this model. Hearing loss is the most important risk factor of all of these factors. Even more important, just a sec, even more important than hypertension, obesity, diabetes is midlife hearing loss. Put that together with social isolation, and you've nearly got 12% of the model. Next uh, slide, please. Now, all very well, but these, this evidence comes from retrospective epidemiological studies. We actually don't yet have prospective data longitudinally followed of cognitive intact individuals to tease out these issues. If we fix them, will we get the results? And some of the data sets we'll be looking at today, for example, um, are starting to address those, like for example, through SANSCOG and others. Next slide, please. Again, these are the questions we need to figure out. What is the impact of hearing aid intervention? What type of the adherence at which point in time? Next slide, please. Having said that, I'll just share again some sense code data with you, which I think are quite compelling. So this is a study that we looked, use, looked at using, again, ELSA data, in which we looked at people and their trajectory of decline before and after getting hearing aid. So this is what's called the spline model. And the point in the data at which people get a hearing a device is what you call putting a knot in the data. And you can see there's a significantly different, there's a significant decrease in the decline following the hearing aid, which I think is a fairly compelling story, but it's still retrospective. And of course, you can challenge this because given somebody a hearing aid, that's what the data tell us. The data don't tell us whether they use the hearing aid. And that's a huge challenge. So we can ask the question a different way. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry, I didn't put the other slide in. Okay, so using a different data set, we did ask that same question, but not hearing aid use, but cataract surgery. Exactly the same question, same analysis, and sure enough, before and after cataract surgery, we saw a decreased, or rather a decreased decline that was significant. And of course, cataract surgery, is, you can't argue with that once they're out, they're out. So I think, again, that strengthens this idea, makes quite compelling. Next slide, please. So that was primary prevention. What about secondary prevention? Now, with all of us working in the field of pathology, brain pathology rather than brain health, by the time people come to us, they already have pathology, they already have MCI dimension, so on. So secondary prevention, you have the condition and you're trying to prevent movement into full syndrome of dementia. So what is the evidence here? Okay, so various interventions, hearing aid rehabilitation, cochlear implants, where there's a very interesting literature emerging, communication strategies, there's a number of different ways in which you can think about intervention in this at-risk or MCI group. Next slide, please. Probably one of the leading studies, and there's two main studies going on, which have yet to read out data, but they're very close. In fact, this one was supposed to read out, I believe, in August of last year, but I haven't seen the results yet. This is from the Baltimore group, from Frank Lynn's study, looking at the impact of hearing aids in people with MCI to understand whether the trajectory to dementia is less. So extremely important landmark study, which will tell us a lot about this intervention, but we don't have the data yet. Next slide. And finally, tertiary prevention. So what is tertiary prevention? People have the condition, they're living with dementia. Can we slow their trajectory? And can we make their lives better? And this is the area in which I've been working for the last five years. So this is my kind of comfort zone, if you will. And over the next few minutes, I'll tidy up by telling you some um, data from our SenseCog RCT. Next slide, please. So the first thing we did when looking at this issue was we did a review of the literature to find out whether interventions had already been done. And as you can see from this review, the data were poor, very little evidence. So clearly there was a research gap. So off we went. Next slide, please. Of all the interventions reported, there's a range of hearing interventions and a range of vision interventions. So this is sort of a, a multifaceted kind of area. Next slide, please. In order to fill the gap, we had to come up with an intervention, right? And so what we did is we followed the MRC's guidance on the development of so-called complex interventions, which is a multifaceted approach in which you do intervention modeling, you look at the evidence, you do needs analysis, and you do feasibility testing to understand what an intervention would look like. 
So we did that over the period of 18 to 24 months. Next slide, please. One of the things we did was to explore the support care needs of people living with hearing and vision impairment to understand exactly what we needed to do. Next slide, please. And we found very high rates of unmet needs, particularly in terms of psychological support for people who had hearing and vision dementia, physical, physical support, health information, and overall carer and carer support. And really the themes that came out is that support is important, but it needs to be tailored. Likewise, we also needed to address care burden, social isolation, and loneliness. And we needed to educate people. All of those findings were feeding into this intervention modeling that we were doing. Next slide, please. So if we put all our information together, as well as a bunch of other work and some reviews and so on, consultation with experts, and we developed the SSI, which is called the Sensory Support Intervention. And these are the components. So a complex intervention, by definition, is one which has multiple components. It's tailored to the individual, may not be delivered in the same way to each person. It involved a full, oops, hang on a second, involved a full hearing and vision assessment, fairly straightforward, but perhaps, you know, with modification considering the person's living with dementia. Provision of glasses and hearing aid is needed. And critically, putting in a sensory support therapist or SST. So we learned from our consultation, we learned from the literature and our clinical experience, simply giving a hearing aid to a person with dementia is a really not going to work. They need that added support. They need that tailoring. They need support with understanding how to use a new device. They also need modification of their sensory environment at home, looking at the lighting, the acoustics, training the carer in communication techniques, and importantly, social networking. So it's a Multifaceted intervention. Next slide, please. It's delivered by the sensory therapist across 12 weeks, home based and supported by the care partner. So, this is whereby some patients or participants learned how to manage the, in the um, hearing aids themselves. Others required the care partner to learn how to manage them, change the batteries, and so on. As part of this initial feasibility program, we had to field trial the intervention. We did this across three different European countries in an open label trial. Next slide, please. And we tested our different instruments. We tested our methods, our logistic pathways, the tolerability, <laughs> acceptability of the devices. And the key finding, of course, being an open label, we had to interpret with caution, but we showed a significant improvement in quality of life. Enough, of, yeah, never mind. carry on, carry on. So that was enough to move forward using the lessons we learned. We went into a full scale RCT. Next slide, please. These are the partners we involved. So you can imagine I had many sleepless nights trying to manage a trial over <laughs> across Western Europe because we had different partners in different languages with different health systems. It was extremely complex. And then of course, next slide, please. Uh, oh, so let me just go through what our screening was. Who did we involve? People with mild to moderate dementia, clinically diagnosed, dementia due to Alzheimer's disease, vascular dementia, or mixed dementia. So we did not include people with less common forms of dementia like FTD or DLB. They had to have a, a clinically significant hearing impairment. And that's one of the many simple devices on the market called HearCheck. And we now use it clinically, it takes two seconds. You know, you check your, your acuity on the left side, the right side, and you get a sense of whether the person has impairment or not. We tested vision. The person had to have a care partner and living at home. Next slide, please. Our primary outcome was not cognition, and I purposely decided not to look at cognition as the primary outcome based on the number of variables involved there. Instead, I felt for this population, what we really wanted to do was improve quality of life. So the Dementia Quality of Life tool from the UK developed by Subi Banerjee and well used and validated over a number of years was our primary outcome with a number of secondary outcomes. Next slide, please. This was our recruitment trajectory. And as you can see here, lo and behold, like all clinical trials, we got dinged by COVID, which was a challenging time. All clinical trial activity stopped across the world, as did our trial. We were about three quarters of the way. So this meant that we had to put everything online, our interventions, our assessments, and so on. And we had long delays in terms of assessment to hearing aid. Very complex time. But we got there in the end. 
and eventually enrolled 252 dyads, a dyad being person with dementia and the care partner. Next slide, please. I'll very briefly run you through the findings. Okay, so very typical kind of profile of people with mild to moderate dementia. What's important here, if you look at the sensory impairment, which is the third row down in light yellow, the vast majority had hearing impairment and or with or without vision impairment. So again, that came through as the key pathology that was unmet, whereas vision impairment alone was a small minority. So it's the hearing impairment that really was the key element. Next slide, please. Okay, so I've already mentioned about the DEMQAL. Next slide, please. Of the participants, 80% received hearing aids. The third received glasses. Next slide, please. And what we found actually at 36 weeks, we were not able to demonstrate any difference in quality of life. Now, we're still trying to understand various reasons why that might be, because intuitively that doesn't fit. And based on our experience within the trial and the positive feedback we got from participants, that didn't add up. However, we had huge complications due to COVID. And also, it could be that the DEM call is not picking up hearing related quality of life, that we were missing the key element because this didn't fit with our qualitative data. Next slide, please. What we did, however, show that at 18 weeks, the DEM call was significantly improved. So in other words, does this tell us that we're getting a short-term improvement and perhaps that ongoing adherence support needs to continue in some way, rather than after 12 weeks, the intervention ends, we get good results, but then it declines over time. So these are things we're still working out and we've got a lot of data to analyze, but it was important nonetheless and gives us an important indication about moving forward. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So I'm going to end it there. I have about 10 slides on sense cognition, which I'm not going to talk about tonight because I know everybody's tired and I'm keeping you from your dinner. But I think I'd like to make the case that um, this is what I consider a compelling, uh, potentially cost-effective and easily understandable intervention for people with dementia that does not involve drugs and that can fit into multidisciplinary services very well. And I believe strongly that SenseCog India would be a really important initiative and we need to understand in this context whether there is scope to be doing this kind of work. Thank you very much. I can stop screen sharing. Thank you very much, Professor Iran, for that excellent presentation where you have taken us through the journey of you know, various literature review and how compelling that the hearing deficit and vision deficit can in in older people can be one of the reasons for dementia and how the secondary and the tertiary and your work. I think it's quite interesting. So let's open the um, both the topics for discussion. And um, I think the people who are online, you can, you can ask the questions online or raise your, you know, hand. But I thought I would just start with two things so that it starts the discussion for both the people, the people on the online. For Dr. Professor Shivkumar, I have two questions, one to Shivkumar and one to Mr. Uh, I see that when you presented it, there is the clinical um, stream and then there is the training stream which you talked about. So what I see is that when it comes to um, the geriatric unit in NIMHANS is able to, truly to its norm, is able to involve a lot of other disciplines and do a lot of work, both clinically and also in training. Uh, I just want to know, and you have also skipped one level and then gone to the community to involve a lot of community people in your training and also in your services. Uh, what I found is the lack is the in between where you talked about the primary health uh, service, primary health, the primary physician not being trained, or now she is going to, Dr. Preeti Sinha is going to start the training. And the other thing which I also felt was the advocacy towards having uh, geriatric psychiatry, both clinical services, multidisciplinary clinical services, and training in other departments of psychiatry 
across the country. And now we have a lot of uh, regional, you know, AIMS sort of centers with the, both in the private and in the public domain. So there, whether the geriatric psychiatry, both in clinical service and training, what is happening there and how is NIMHANS taking a lead in advocacy to sort of promote this, uh, to have a multidisciplinary team and uh, collaborations. Thanks for the question, ma'am. Uh, actually, uh, uh, in terms of healthcare uh, uh, services, I think the focus on primary healthcare at all levels is something very important. And as well as secondary healthcare, uh, so uh, geriatric population actually uh, they form a large chunk in the healthcare system, whether it's the primary care or secondary care or other specialities. So integrating mental health care with all these people and sensitizing them is an important agenda. Uh, so uh, uh, as Priti has been doing this dementia echo training, we reached out to the uh, family physicians as well as primary care uh, physicians. And this is one initiative which uh, with the CSR support has been happening. And we are also part of the IDASA initiative where uh, 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 we, we uh, along with other partners like SCAR, DEMCARES, and so we are, we are training uh, people uh, from psych which which in the, the trainees included psychiatrists as well as other uh, people who are interested in dementia care. Now, uh, apart from this, I think our community team, I think I didn't highlight this, our the community uh, psychiatry team has been uh, linking uh, with all the health systems uh, in multiple states, uh, Uttarakhand or uh, Chhattisgarh. With the government, they collaborate as well as in Karnataka. In all these initiatives, when they train basic mental health, they also, in some of the states, like for example, Uttarakhand uh, and Chhattisgarh. Chhattisgarh, I think, uh, the specialization when it was covered, children as well as geriatric are integral part of the specialty training. And uh, we have trained <coughs> the community health officers online. And uh, we have been part of the initiatives of the government. We have been also talking to the National Program for Healthcare FL Delhi. And uh, just a few days back, we have discussed and we are trying to train the community health officers in one of the districts now. So uh, this will be an ongoing initiative in terms of how we can actually integrate mental health with the, uh, with the uh, primary health care system. I think uh, Karnataka is one example where this integration can happen much more closely. I think the government uh, system here and our uh, community team works very closely. And we as uh, one stakeholder, I think we will do it. And also, I think now the tele mental health program that is coming up will also be another thing where Elderly will become one of the important uh, component of it. So we will uh, join hands and we will do our bit in all these initiatives. So we will not leave the public health system. I think I think uh, uh, it is one of the important focus for us. With respect to building network and promoting geriatric psychiatry training across other institutions, I think Vijay uh, and our team has been networking with various colleges. I think the, uh, our fellowship program offers some training but for a limited number of people, but I'm sure there are very many teams who can actually do. Uh, for example, Dr. Somshekar Bijal is here. Uh, he heads a department of medical college and uh, department of psychiatry medical college. There are uh, like-minded institutions we have been discussing and the Indians program, which Dr. Matthew was uh, there, uh, was focused on PGs in psychiatry, wherein uh, some 10, 12 core lectures were held uh, focusing on uh, training geriatric psychiatry uh, training uh, for postgraduates. And uh, many of these places, uh, full-fledged specialty services have not uh, happened, but uh, when you look, take care of specialty children, child specialty, child cl clinic is much more uh, active. Geriatric is something which is going to uh, yeah, become more active time. over a period of time. We will network, I think, uh, uh, as part of Mental Health Act, Child and geriatric have been kind of recognized as a specialty which all the services should offer. And with the changing demography, I think we will get our place and we will uh, definitely contribute. And in terms of geriatricians or regional centers, I think with the LASI network, actually many of them are actually geriatricians. We are interacting with them, but probably we have not tapped that source. We uh, need to see as to how mental health can be integrated. In all these places, there are departments of psychiatry. Most of these regional centers are housed in medical colleges and our psychiatry departments are there. And when our That's specialty is awesome. more, yeah. I think definitely there will be some possibility of uh, them actually joining hands and uh, 
uh, enhancing the uh, care. I think uh, we have a long way to go. I think uh, we have started somewhere, and we, I think you, what you have started, we have we are trying to do it. Maybe uh, by another twenty years, I think we'll we'll, we'll be able to reach much more. <laughs> we still have a long way to go. Uh, the, and I had a question for uh, you, Professor. Who are these therapists? You said that they are an integrated yes. therapist. Are they nurses? Or, uh, are they? Yes. Who are they? That's a really important question and a complex question because ultimately, moving forward to implementation, you need to have some kind of recognition of a therapist type. So, because that kind of pathway is very long and complicated, we've purposely designed a job profile and a job description to fit people who had suitable clinical skills coming from any background. So in the trial of the different seven sites, we had two occupational therapists, one psychologist, one social worker, and one um, hearing rehabilitation therapist, um, and another psychologist, if I remember correctly. So they, it's really about having the core competencies rather than coming from a particular discipline. And we then designed a small training program and um, you know, very basic things, starting with awareness, starting with the recognition of how you communicate and how you pass it on to a parent, and then working with specific issues to do with the device of so, you know, how to teach changing the batteries and these kinds of things. So very basic practical things. There is a system of aged care in, which is usually run by nurses mm. in most of the Western countries. Mm. So those people are not part and parcel of this work, which we're, we're not at the stage where we've moved into implementation. I mean, that would be for the future. So if we feel that this has traction, if we feel it's cost effective, I haven't given you the, the health economic data that go along with this, um, then there's a case to be made of how does this fit into the existing system and exactly who will do it. Um, but it's quite interesting, anecdotally, our research occupational therapist who um, worked on our project for three years, she left clinical services, went back to clinical services, was found that almost every day with her older patients, she was fiddling with hearing aids and couldn't keep her hands off them because it's such a, a need. And she then, of course, had the skills and there was nobody else that could fill that need. I mean, the audiologists were absolutely brilliant, but they could only take it so far. Once the person's off on their own, back in the home, that's when the difficulties arise. So. so there's a question by Dr. Vigil. Can you yeah. unmute and ask the question? Good evening, sir. Uh, good evening, madam. Uh, I have a question and uh, I have an one comment also. Uh, first, I'd like to go to further question. Uh, actually, the people with dementia, uh, it was very difficult to have that spectacles or uh, uh, hearing aid. So how it was corrected in your study, madam? That is usually they remove it they very frequently, hearing aid, if you place it. So how that challenge was met in the, your study? That is number one. And with respect to the, uh, my comment is, uh, uh, even uh, in, in the, with the guidance of Dr. Uh, Professor P.T. Shukumar and um, Dr. Vijay, uh, we have taken up a study uh, in Jim's Gadag, uh, looking at the uh, prevalence of the dementia or mild cognitive impairment in the people coming with the, uh, coming to the non-communicable disease clinic, because under the national program of uh, healthcare of elderly, as well as the NCD program, so uh, we have a lot of people who are coming. So what I suggest is, what I uh, think is, suppose if you screen uh, for the hearing impairment or uh, visual impairment, uh, when the people who are above 60 having mild cognitive impairment, and Government of India already has some programs, uh, the cataract surgeries have done free of cost, number one. Number two, some hearing aids are also given to the, some people who are having a, uh, who are up the below poverty line. So suppose if you take up that um, in association with the government of Karnataka and India, and demands along with uh, various uh, NCD clinics uh, across country, um, can we uh, see the uh, uh, prevalence, whether the MCI people, uh, if they have the sensory impairment, if we address that, can the prevalence of the dementia can come, come down? That is one, and uh, based on that quality of the life also will be improved. That is what my comment. So I'd like to ask Madam um, how the challenge of uh, uh, hearing impairment and uh, spectacles was met. Um, so so that's, that's the entire point of the, of the sensory therapist being put in place because we went into this based on our scoping and modeling activities, knowing that that would be an issue, that again, giving hearing aids simply wouldn't be good enough. So the sensory therapist worked at home 
with the care partner and the person with dementia to problem solve around the hearing aid use. Sometimes it was very straightforward. A person could use it, they could manage it, change the batteries. Sometimes it was extremely difficult. We had one patient who refused to wear the hearing aid outside the house because of stigma. There was another patient who couldn't tolerate anything touching their, their head, for example. So with the skills, the clinical skills of the therapist, they were able to problem solve and goal set. Now, it didn't always work. Hearing aids aren't always, always the solution. In some cases, they would um, opt for different kinds of devices like pocket talkers. And so it's about having that flexibility. But I think the key thing is that you essentially go from, you know, 100% lack of success generally, I'm exaggerating, to at least a greater chance of success for the use of the hearing aid. Now, in terms of the actual data around that, there's a couple of things we're doing. One is called the black box study. And that's, we have um, just nearly finished the looking at the data of who got what. In other words, of the intervention, who got, um, you know, how many visits, how long it took, <laughs> what kinds of support they needed in terms of the group as a whole. And that's part of us understanding the cost effectiveness, how much involvement is necessary to make this a success. So that's our black box. In other words, trying to understand the intervention and its complexities. And the second initiative is one of our, our lead occupational therapists in the study, Emma Hooper. She's doing her PhD on adherence, adherence barriers and facilitators for hearing aid use to people with dementia. She's just published a very beautiful systematic review on the topic, looking at barriers and facilitators. But now she's going to look at the clinical trial data, partly using diaries but also using the data logging of the hearing aids themselves to really understand objectively who used what when, and then we can get a better, better sense of it. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you, thank you, ma'am. Uh, Professor PT, uh, can you, uh, that come, I mean, uh, can we do that in, the, in collaboration with the government of India and uh, um, Karnataka, uh, those MCI people who will made mandatory for those people to undergo evaluation and cataract surgeries are done free of cost everywhere uh, under the government uh, program, uh, national program for control of blindness. So also we can take up this hearing aids also if there is one project can be uh, made. Yeah, just just today, uh, just before Irasma uh, had come, uh, we had a discussion with Sankara uh, uh, I, uh, Vision Academy, Vision uh, uh, Sankara Eye Hospital, uh, yes, and the team had come, and uh, we had discussed this opportunity where. When we are conducting outreach uh, camps, that they can participate so that um, I, I, I camps and memory camps are conducted mm -hmm. jointly. And also, I think they do uh, and per year from 20, 25,000 patients, uh, they do cataract surgery in their own hospital in Bangalore. So they have invited us to uh, kind of see as to how we can integrate memory screening uh, within that. So this is just happening today. So I think uh, there's a huge opportunity and uh, uh, we, we, we are just uh, discussing about this collaboration with, with respect to I. Just before we were meeting, we had the meeting with the IT. So hearing, I think we have an in-house team, but I think, again, there are lots of organizations working uh, for hearing aids. I think our community team, our Center for Public Health team had done some project in uh, Kolar where they tried to give, with the help of CSR support, they tried to give hearing aids mm -hmm. and then they look at. I think there's huge potential in there. Mm -hmm. I think we need to join hands and find mm -hmm. Uh, uh, ways how we can correct uh, mm. hearing impairment. Mm. I think Lassie has given uh, data again. Uh, 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 also, Lassie Dad, I think a more sophisticated assessment on the, mm. of hearing mm. is being done. We will have enough data to advocate for these things. I think uh, with respect to hearing, uh, the scope for prevention is something, uh, uh, dementia prevention is one other factor. But other than dementia, I think uh, promoting well-being mm. and uh, uh, addressing this loneliness and social isolation mm. There's a huge opportunity for change and it has an implication for mental health in a big way. Uh, uh, you are, uh, we will definitely have to work uh, towards this with our counterparts uh, in the public health system. Yes. Uh, if we have to make some meaningful difference. I think I and hearing institutes, uh, what they do as outreach service and then the technologies are advancing significantly. Uh, we have a huge opportunity when, where we can link mental health. It's a good suggestion, uh, uh, Bijan. Thank you, thanks, sir. Thank you. Thanks, Vigil. Thanks, thanks. Uh, Thank there you. are three more uh, comments and questions, and two of them uh, say that the uh, topics, what the talks were excellent. But the question, I think, is to Dr. Shukma saying that 
current argument seems to be for geriatric psychiatry units in tertiary care centers. Do we have a strong argument for such specialist teams in health services as well? That is, that is not in teaching centers. Yeah. yeah. If so, what are they? Sudeep, thanks uh, for participating in this program. I think. Uh, uh, you, uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> so it's very nice uh, to uh, have you in this program. And uh, uh, I, I think uh, uh, geriatrics, uh, when we took, uh, when we when we approach an elderly care, we are not actually recommending where only specialists are there. I think we need to train more and more people where they will be uh, following appropriate uh, evaluation and management of elderly with mental health problems, whether it is psychiatrists, whether it is other mental health professionals, and it is not something exceptional for teaching centers. I think teaching centers have a role in uh, training people. Uh, but in terms of service, I think training and sensitizing towards geriatric mental health care is required for uh, uh, all specialists. If you look at what is the exposure that is happening as part of our training, how well we are uh, actually equipped to provide a care in a way where we don't harm them. I think we have a long way to go because I think one of the things what we see is a lot of hydrogenic effects happens, whether it is about ir irrational use of medications uh, and uh, uh, identifying dementia, identifying cognitive problems and preventing certain things, even though we can't cure them, but appropriate care and providing support services. Uh, I, I think psychiatrists are one important source of, uh, uh, say, uh, for seeking help. Many people with dementia, because of behavioral problems, they go first to psychiatrists. And there are also psychiatrists that are widely available. And go, coming with DMHP, now we are much more available than other specialists. For example, geriatricians or neurologists are quite limited. So that way, I think uh, this is not an exception that we have to focus on teaching centers. I think it has to be across uh, the service, whether it is in a district hospital or in a uh, other service hospital, we need to provide training. I think uh, now the technology, the online platforms, what we are having, uh, I think we have Dr. Matthews leading a geriatric consortium. I think there are quite a few people and majority, many of them are from UK, trained in old age psychiatry. And uh, there is an active group available, including Sudhir and Shiba. Shiba was also joining this program. I think we all have a job to do and uh, uh, we can train and we can, It's. Uh, I think more than training, I think it is about uh, sensitizing people and then uh, uh, ensuring proper standards are uh, kind of uh, adhered in terms of treatment, appropriate treatment is done. So there's one more uh, important question, and that is whether statistics are available about availability of clinical facilities in all district headquarters. Maybe Dr. Shukumar or Dr. Yeah. Vigil wants to answer this. Yeah. Uh, that is to screen dementia. So this is my and father. Related, yeah, I know. It's your father. <laughs> asking this Thank question. you, Mr. Tangaraj, for <laughs> participating and asking this question. It's a very important question. Yeah. And I think, uh, yeah. In Vigil, you want to answer or Shubhan wants to answer? Whether it's available in district, uh, whether you have enough people to screen uh, uh, in district so, services. Uh, I, 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 so uh, I, I think in terms of uh, districts, definitely uh, psychiatrists are available in many of the places, particularly in South India, if you take Tamil Nadu or uh, Karnataka or Kerala, I think almost all the districts we have psychiatrists. Neurologists may not be there in the district hospitals that many, but physicians are available. And they do screen and they do provide treatment for dementia. I think the problem is more in people recognizing and going and seeking help. And uh, possibly if somebody is going for a cataract, possibly is going for uh, some other health condition, opportunistic screening, again, may not happen. I think we are focused on providing treatment for what they have come for. So, for example, NCD care for diabetes or hypertension when they are going, how many of them screen for memory? So uh, there are things like, uh, say, uh, there are some four uh, things which are linked to diabetes are screened. For example, vision is screened, uh, whether there's neuropathy is there are screened, in some of the diabetes hospitals. But I, would, I don't think memory is part of that. I think one of our students, uh, Dr. Strikla had guided about screening people with uh, uh, diabetes. diabetes. We looked at how uh, memory uh, uh, impairment is there. I think uh, when it comes to geriatrics, if you are able to sensitize everybody, an opportunistic screening will be very helpful. And I think that is something which we need to be... Uh, I don't think it is available in public health system as good as it should be required. We still have a long way to go. 
but the, the basic framework is available but we need training and we need uh, that the problem is about time the yeah, problem is about back time. in yeah. put the question yeah. back in so i think mr tangraj i don't know if dr vijil wants to answer this uh, the issue is i think that uh, npsc is supposed to do this but uh, people are not there on the ground in all areas so i think there is an issue there is but supposed to be npsc is available but i think the focus all... on mental health and focus on memory dementia is yeah. uh, limited Vijil, you want to say yeah yes sir yes sir actually uh, under the uh, district mental health program uh, we are updating our uh, statistics sir every month uh, even from the community health centers as well as uh, from the district hospitals and uh, dmhp so in which there is a column about the dementia so especially those people uh, who are having severe dementia or moderate to severe dementia uh, their number is in, uh, uh, every every month it will be updated to the state registry sir that is number one number two is uh, from uh, this month uh, probably from february 1st we will be launching the uh, e minus registry system in which every outpatient pa outpatient as well as the inpatient with any of the psychiatric conditions it could be a uh, common mental disorders or severe mental disorders so the registry is online registry will be starting across karnataka sir so that is, so that we can have a better figures so under the npsc program um uh, the those who are having severe dementia their number and their uh, data is uh, as of today it's available across state uh, under this program and uh, with respect to the those people who are coming to the ncd clinic so that is what the first time uh, um, with the help of dr vijay harbishetar and dr pt we started that so we are doing that um, study so uh, probably over a period of time once this year uh, emns will be um, uh establish across state probably by march uh, end so every month we will get a data about all the, um, uh, the dementia cases even including those who are in the community and uh, that is also again linked to the mhrb and uh, mental health uh, authority portal sir yeah, thanks vijay this uh, quite up to date information it's good to know that something is happening at the on the ground yes sir. one more question from dr uh, sudhir to professor leroy and that is you describe them as diets mm. does that mean that all participants had caregivers living with them care partners mm. who ensure the continued use of assistive devices even when sensory mm. therapist was not there mm. um uh, an inclusion criteria for the study was that you needed a study partner or a care partner generally they lived with a person but they didn't have to and we had certain criteria for the number of contacts one had to have per week um so the sensory therapist was only there once a week for a certain you know period of time yes. upwards of an hour so um the primary care was really educating the care partner in terms of managing the devices but also aspects of communication and addressing social isolation so they were um critical in terms of making this the intervention a success thank you very much so um we come to the end of this program i think what we have been able to achieve in the last 1 hour and 15 or 20 minutes is two very diverse sort of topics which we have been able to one focused on uh, the indian situation the indian scenario especially a specialized unit a geriatric center which has super specialty training and a multi uh, disciplinary collaboration how they are proceeding in various streams of clinical services research on train training clinical services research and training and also <laughs> how they are able to bring in a lot of advocacy towards the community uh, on healthy aging and also towards uh, dementia and other elderly related psychiatric morbidity taking from there we have had uh, professor leroy very very specifically very expertly talking about an area of you know um, dementia which is related to sensory deprivation i think very very impressive where we have been able to look at how a very very common aging process like hearing can be a direct and an indirect um, effect on dementia not only dementia but also on the quality of life and also in turn affects the quality of life in people with dementia and also the carrier burden and how something like that can be tested over time with an rct not only looking at the literature but or doing an open um, label open study open label study and then an rct 
I think that would have been very, very useful for all the people who are doing fellowship, DOE, DM, and PhD to sort of plan their own work, taking any bit of advice from that. And it has been a very, very um, educative, academic, and a pleasant evening. Thank you very much, both of you, for that. And I wish all of you a good night. And I thank Nim Hans for calling, inviting Matthew and me to chair this session. Yes. Um, I would like I would like to now invite Professor P.T. Shivkumar, sir, to give the memento to Professor Leroy. <laughs> this is our department uh, signal. I think so. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to Yeah. So I think it's very small so that you can carry. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. We didn't want to add you. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Thank, thanks for coming. Absolute pleasure. Uh, thank you. So I, I think. Uh, um, yeah. I would like to now invite uh, Dr. Vijay to give the vote of thanks. Yeah, uh, it gives me immense pleasure again uh, to uh, deliver this vote of thanks. Uh, uh, the earlier was uh, meant to be uh, by uh, Dr. Preeti, but she's unable to make it because of her uh, busy schedule regarding the size of software work. Uh, she, may be, she may have joined online, but she's not. Anyway, okay. So, so I, I thank uh, Professor P.T. Shivkumar for uh, organizing this program uh, and uh, you know arranging this program. This is uh, uh, you know uh, attended by a lot of people online and uh, a lot of people had shown interest. Um, Dr. Uh, Professor Matthew Vargas and uh, Dr. Sri Kalabharat, uh, I thank you very much for. Uh, uh, you know, uh, making time and coming here and uh, helping us out uh, and running this uh, by chairing the session. Um, so it was a uh, well received talk. I as as far as I know from the feedback that we have received online. Uh, I thank uh, Dr. K, uh, Krishna Prasad, Dr. Ajit Dhanale for uh, uh, being uh, part, for having coming come here and participated the, in this session. Dr. Preeti Sina, uh, I'm not sure if he's around, but uh, in her absence. Yeah. Dr. Somshek Abhijal, thank you very much for being there. Uh, Professor Tirumurthy, thank you very much. And uh, his team, social work team, thank you very much. Uh, and I thank uh, the psychology team also. I thank Chandru from the BME team and the whole of BME team for helping us out, data center team, for helping us out, the integrative medicine. Um, and then I also thank uh, the, uh, all the members of the Geriatric Psychiatry team for uh, participating actively. And, uh, you know, uh, it's been nearly two hours and, you know, almost three, touching two hours and you're all you're all tired, I know. Uh, thank you very much. I thank Mr. Bharat for uh, patiently uh, you know, <laughs> joining us and, uh, you know, being with us. Um, and last but not least, of course, I uh, have to thank my guru, my research guru, my, uh, you know, mentor, uh, several papers which I had with her. And the top five belongs to her uh, that have got uh, highest citations. Uh, she's an excellent guru, I can tell you. She is an excellent supervisor, teacher, uh, trainer, and uh, she, she can teach you. You can just spend some time, you learn something. And uh, to the extent that I've reached to uh, become an editor in chief for a journal, a new journal, as well as I'm sitting here as a faculty today. Thank you very much. It's all. <laughs> Some of the credit must go to you. Uh, the, 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 so I kept you at uh, the last. Thank you. Thank you for coming and uh, keep coming. Uh, I would love, love to host you. And please. Uh, you can invite me. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was the last statement you had made last time, but uh, I, I didn't get a chance. Uh, anyway. <laughs> And uh, you know, Matthew sir is uh, on, on my behalf. As in my <laughs> so uh, please keep coming and thank you, everyone. If I missed anyone, it's not. Uh, the, it's we my, also got not, support from Icon. Yeah, uh, from Icon team, I have to thank uh, uh, the, the you know Ganesh and uh, Ganesh Arun uh, and all everyone. So thank you very much. Sorry, you were saying something. Yeah. So, can you all uh, the participants online uh, turn on your video so we can take a screenshot so you have participated, please. Uh, next few minutes, we'll give you uh, next few minutes. You can take a screenshot if you come online and uh, and switch on your videos. Who are can? Yeah, <laughs> 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 
Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everyone who have participated online, sitting patiently and listening to this talk. Um, we will continue to uh, uh, do yeah. such talks in the future, many more. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I would thank like you. to invite everyone on behalf of the geriatric psychiatry team, Department of thank Psychiatry, you. Uh, to join us for dinner. Here, local people. <laughs> Only those who have uh, who are uh, who have made it here and are in the boardroom. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.